All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started now. It's just after um, noon. Uh, so welcome to uh, this webinar series in the introduction to architectural styles. Part one, uh, making the city, uh, happy preservation month. This is gonna be uh, part one of three webinars on architectural styles in Denver um, that we're offering as a sort of special celebration of preservation month. Uh, my name is Evan Shuckler. I'm an associate city planner with uh, Denver Landmark Preservation, and I'm joined by Abby Christman. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, Abby's a senior city planner with us in Landmark Preservation. Um, I'll be doing most of the uh, talking and presenting in part one and part two of this series, and then Abby's gonna be leading part three. Um, we do have um, uh, some kind of uh, chat and hand raise functions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this page says Q&A, but it's actually uh, just a chat. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can raise your hand or uh, drop it into the Q, uh, excuse me, into the chat. And then Abby's going to be monitoring that and will um, interrupt my blathering uh, when there's something uh, someone wants to ask about the presentation. So please feel free to interrupt us um, if we can clarify something. So, um, the first thing we wanted to do is kind of lay out um, a roadmap for this series. Um, and before we dig into the content of this slide, I wanted to kind of talk about why we're giving this presentation and why we're talking about architectural styles. Um, you know, architecture is a significant part of uh, the history of the built environment and the, the study of architecture and the understanding of it. Um, and it's one of the main ways, um, it's one of the main ways that one can designate a building in Denver as historically significant for its architecture or, you know, as the work of an architect. Um, so understanding architectural styles is really essential when trying to apply those designation criteria to, um, you know, historic designations or when even looking at existing designations and wanting to learn about that history. Um, our criteria emphasize, you know, architectural styles or architectural typologies. Um, and one of the things we really want to emphasize in this uh, webinar series is that, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity to architectural styles. And it isn't sort of just, you know, picking out a building and applying the name of a style to it, but it's really kind of understanding what does a building tell us? What does it say about the people, the places, the people that built it, the people that lived in it, the place where that building exists? Um, and also maybe some of the values that those groups had. So that's, you know, kind of why we're looking at that. Um, and, and sometimes you'll also get really interesting layers of history that um, sort of accrue on buildings. Um, and if you can parse out those different layers, you can learn a lot about the, the history of a building. So the goal of this webinar series is really to provide a set of uh, lenses or a set of tools that you can use when trying to understand architectural styles and architectural history and to you know, sort of read those buildings that exist. So the way we're gonna achieve that in this series as sort of laid out here is we have a couple of main concepts that I'm gonna cover quickly uh, next, which are style, architectural style versus architectural type or typology, the character defining features of styles or types, and then also looking at um, the use of a building, whether uh, residential versus commercial. So those main concepts are gonna kind of frame how we present each style. And then we've broken the sort of architectural history of Denver into these three presentations. So we're in part one, making the city. Part two is revivalism and new American architecture. And part three is of course, um, modernism. Uh, I think I'm forgetting the full name of part three, <laughs> um, but uh, it's more about modernist history. And then at each, um, during each of these parts, we're also going to introduce some new themes um, that are most relevant maybe to that particular era that we're talking about, but that could be applied across the board. So that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about those lenses or those um, tools for viewing and understanding buildings. So we'll move on now to these main concepts of the series. So the first one is uh, style versus type. Um, and on the left, we have a bit of a um, sizable block of text, but I'll just go through this. So. When we're talking about an architectural style, we're talking about a collection of characteristics, features, and design principles that make a structure identifiable to an era or to an aesthetic. They're often, but not always, um, designed by architects or craftspeople who are trained in architectural history and design philosophy, 
Uh, and like fashion, um, you know, architectural styles grow in popularity, they evolve, you know, in their heyday, and then they also fade over time. An architectural type is different because it's more of a, it's more about a typical arrangement of a building's floor plan, the massing and the forms that reflect how a building is used. So uh, a given type can be decorated or dressed in different styles or even mixes of styles. Um, and then these types are often based on common practice or tradition. So on the right here, we have uh, two what we call four square type buildings, which is a very common typology in Denver, which is a, a pretty square building um, that is really arranged on the first and second floor as four rooms or four spaces. You know, so it's, it's basically just broken into quadrants. So both of these buildings are the four square type, but the one on the left is more of a kind of craftsman style, as you can see through some of the brackets and the half timbering and the shingles the jerk and head roof and things like that. Whereas the one on the right has a little bit more maybe Mediterranean or kind of Italian flavor to it. So same type, different styles. Um, and I hope that helps highlight um, how you kind of think about those uh, when you think about style versus when you think about type. The next main concept is character defining features, um, which are the architectural characteristics or features that are common to a style. Um, these can include ornamental details or motifs uh, architectural features like a porch, the arrangement of windows and doors, roof forms or types of dormers, roofing uh, building materials, or even the building massing and the building shape. So one of the important things to remember is that a list of character defining features is not exhaustive. So um, as we go through these styles um, in the later part of this presentation, we're going to list out some of the character defining features, but they're not you know, something does not have to meet all of those features in order to be of that style. It can have, you know, architects will kind of cherry pick uh, which features they apply to uh, embody a particular style. Um, and then it's also important to remember that many styles share specific features or ornaments. So this, uh, a style is really defined by the mixing of the character defining features and then how they're used in relation to each other. So on the right here, we have a couple of features. The top left is, um, you know, sort of a very classical capital with a cornice and entablature, um, which may be very common to a neoclassical building, or it could also be something you see on a Renaissance revival or a um, or uh, a Georgian revival or something like that. To the right of that, you see some half timbering and a steep roof and a sort of compounded chimney. The, the half timbering is a good example of something that you'll see in a lot of styles. It's common to the Tudor Revival, which is this building, but is also something that you can see in Queen Anne or Craftsman architecture. So um, again, and then below that, we have a couple of different windows to show the variety of how, you know, you have a particular window form with some detailing around it versus, you know, very simple windows that are arranged in a particular way and how these are some of the character defining features of, of different styles. That window on the left is a Queen Anne and the one on the right is a sort of streamlined modern building here in Denver. And then the final main concept that we wanted to introduce is again, kind of the scale and the use. So we're framing it as residential versus commercial. And that um, for these different uses, this, the same style can present very differently. So these three buildings I'm showing you are really Renaissance revival buildings but you know the form, uh, you can see how that, that style is applied very differently based off of the scale of the building. So a single family home on the left, quite a grand one, but still a single family building with a porch and um, you know, uh, more, uh, more irregular window placement. And then next to that, we have the equity building here in Denver, which is a, you know, quite a monumental uh, Renaissance revival building that uh, was originally office space. So you can see how the details on that house on the left really get scaled up across this uh, monstrous building. And then to the right of that is um, one of our public libraries here in Denver, which is uh, more of a civic or uh, public building. And how, again, the, the pattern of the windows changes, the way that the uh, details are applied changes a little bit. So again, all three are Renaissance revival buildings, but uh, apply the same details and the same style in a different way. Uh, and then, as I said, we have a couple of additional themes that we're going to be introducing throughout the series. So here's a quick breakdown of that. Um, I won't dwell on part two and three because we'll come to those in the next parts. But for this first one, we're talking about uh, historical precedence and adaptation. And then we want to touch on the concept of architecture, architect designed architecture versus vernacular architecture. Um, and so 
again, th those themes will come up again in some of the future um, parts of the series, as well as introducing some new themes. So a couple of kind of disclaimers, we're calling them uh, to sort of frame this presentation. The first of this is that, you know, we're not covering all styles, um, all American styles. Um, we're really limiting these to um, the architecture that's found in Denver between 1858, the date of the city's founding, and the present. Um, you know, there are earlier forms, which I'll touch on in a second, but there are also architectural styles common to the US in parts of the country that were settled by Westerners um, earlier on. So a couple of prominent things that we're not going to touch about are, um, you know, Native American architecture. Colorado has, you know, a fabulous collection of um, Native American uh, architectural and archaeological sites. Um, you know, unfortunately, none of those are in Denver or really in the immediate Denver area. So we're not really going to dwell on those, even though that's a significant part of the, um, you know, the architectural history of Colorado. We're also not going to talk about colonial or Georgian architecture um, or Greek revival, which is one of the styles that kind of comes just before uh, where we're beginning. And then the other disclaimer is that we're not really going to talk about what we're what we call sort of frontier architecture, which is the sort of really fast and cheap slapdash architecture that was thrown up in the very earliest days of um, you know Westerners settling Colorado and the Denver area. So some of these styles like the false front architecture, you know, that kind of stereotypical Western Main Street um, was something that was very common in Denver in its very earliest days, but almost all of that has since been lost. And then there's also the Carpenter Gothic, um, which would have been a common style. So again, you can imagine these having existed in Denver, though there's very few examples left, um, though you may still be able to find them in some of the surrounding uh, communities, maybe up in the mountains or out on the plains. So um, the other piece of this is uh, we're going to provide a little bit of kind of historical context to each of these presentations uh, at a few points to provide some some background for the styles that we're talking about. So for this particular presentation on sort of making the city the the earliest um, some of the earliest days of Denver's architectural history, one of the main influences was the Romantic movement. Um, which was really a response to the sort of classical. Um, influences and the orderly outlook of the more kind of colonial era in the United States. So the classical um, influences are about order, reason, balance, stability, and restraint. You know, you can sort of see there in this this um, image of a of like a um, Greek revival or a classical revival country home that it's you know all very symmetrical and orderly. It stands out in opposition to the landscape. Um, and, and is, is a much more sort of ordered outlook versus the picturesque, which is more about, um, you know, it's again, a reaction against this classicism and it's more about emotion and individualism, you know, exuberance, there's a lot more color and dynamicism, dynamism, dynamism <laughs> sorry, to um, that, uh, that era of architecture. And then there's also more of a relationship to nature. So you can see that in this image here of, you know, a sort of a more of a castle-like structure, a medieval looking structure that's nestled into the landscape, which is much more, um, you know, dynamic and shifted. So this is a, a sort of set of social, um, it's sort of a social movement, it's a set of aesthetic and artistic principles that is really the backdrop to a lot of the styles we're going to be talking about in this first one. Or, you know, as well, thinking about the, um, the interplay between these, you know, is a style more on that classical side, a little more orderly, or maybe it, it leans into that picturesque, um, and a romantic outlook on things. So now we're going to get into the meat of it, which is the uh, architectural styles themselves. And our first one up here is the Italianate. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a, a map as well, we have uh, the style there underlined above that are the kind of typical date range that you would see that in. Below that, we're going to show some different examples of the, the sort of scale of building. So here we're looking at a residential. There'll be a commercial one next. Um, below that are some of the kind of bigger picture elements of this. So um, for this Italianate, we're looking at a very boxy massing. It's quite a squat kind of squarish building. The windows are arranged very re regularly. Um, and then they'll also sometimes on this style, you'll see more classical influences. So thinking about that, what we're just talking about as far as um, the, the romantic versus the classical, um, this style maybe leans a little bit more on that classical side of things. So these uh, bullet points are kind of main um, 
concepts or main big large scale features of the style and then on the right we have sort of specific things pointed out so for this italianate we have you know the the proportions of the window are often very tall and narrow sorry i need to stop um clicking on the screen uh you'll also sometimes see that that uh boxy massing is broken by a projecting bay like you see here on the left you'll also often see a frame you know a wood construction front porch and then one of the most iconic features of this style is really that really prominent cornice with the brackets um, that run along it so again this is sort of a residential scale building and then we can look at italianate um, on a commercial building and you'll see some of the similarities but of course this building looks much much different. It's much larger, of course, um, and uh, looks much heavier. But you can see some of these same features of a very boxy massing. The windows are arranged very regularly. Um, there are some classical influences, but you have the same very prominent bracketed cornice, the tall, narrow windows. And then, of course, because this is a commercial building, one of the main differences is the tall storefront at the first floor, as opposed to the more residential scale um, windows on the, the first building we've looked at. So our next style is the Victorian Gothic, which, you know, now if you're thinking back to that um, picturesque, this is really a style that embodies that romantic movement. Um, you know, comparing this to that regularity and formality of the Italianate, you can see how there's quite a lot going on in this building with um, all of the different massing, um, all of the different roof forms and how these things interrelate. So the Victorian Gothic has a much more varied massing and has very generally quite steeply pitched roofs. Um, you'll see things like the parapeted gables, the buttressing, pointed arches, of course, are a common feature of the Gothic revival. Lancet windows, which will be these very tall and narrow windows. Um, and you'll even sometimes see the castle-like details, the crenellations at the top of the tower or the turrets um, over on the right here. Uh, you know, this style is actually quite uncommon in Denver, I would say. There's only a handful examples of churches really built in this style. In other parts of the country, you might see residential Victorian Gothic or even, you know, institutional buildings. But um, in Denver, it's mostly uh, churches. Um, and so that's another sort of thing you'll pick up on. Certain styles may be more common to commercial uses or institutional uses versus re residential or, or vice versa. Uh, so moving on, we're looking at the Second Empire style, um, which um, you know some of the common feats of this uh, features of this are a more varied massing. So you can see in this example that there's sort of a central mass, but then there's you know, a side, a projecting sort of sunroom addition, a bay, a front bay, the porch on the side. So it's a little more complicated. The most iconic feature of this style is really the mansard roof, which is this um, quite steeply pitched roof with then a shallower roof on top of it. Um, this style also generally has a strong horizontal emphasis, which you can kind of see in the emphasis on the cornice and the color and the shingles, as well as the foundation, all sort of emphasizing that horizontality. Um, this particular example doesn't have it, but um, a lot of times you'll also see a really strong classical influence again in this style. Um, and again, here are some of the, the features, the horizontal string courses, decorative masonry, um, tall, narrow windows, uh, turrets, and things like that, a prominent porch. Um, so this is, this is a kind of quintessential example of a residential Second Empire building in Denver. There will also be sometimes um, commercial examples of this. Uh, so here's one on Larimer Street. And uh, you can see that this one is a little bit more uh, formal, a little more restrained. You can actually see down at the storefront that this includes kind of Corinthian capitals, again, more of that classical influence. But it has a lot of the same features in terms of um, you know, tall, narrow windows, a strong horizontal emphasis, and of course, the mansard roof. Um, here, excuse me, here, of course, the mansard roof is almost more of a, a false roof uh, because behind this is a quite a large flat roof, but that's also a common feature of the commercial version of this style. Uh, so this is a page uh, that there's a couple of these scattered throughout the this part as well as the other parts um, where we're looking at, you know, okay, the Second Empire as it appears in Denver versus how it may look elsewhere, just as a kind of point of comparison. So. Um, 
the Second Empire is not a particularly common style in Denver, I would say. There, are, there aren't a great number of, of examples of it, but you can see what many of them look like. They're, they're generally more modest, um, like the one at the, at the bottom right here is a good example where you have, um, you know, it's one and a half story with that half story being in the mansard roof, much like the first example we, we looked at. Um, the top right one is a little bit more decorative. Uh, you can see it has that kind of the curved mansard roof, which is a variant that you'll see. Uh, but then if you kind of compare these Denver examples to the ones on the left, um, which are ones kind of just found uh, typical examples that we found throughout the country, um, you can see how much variety there is to this style. The bottom left is maybe the most quintessential um, Second Empire building. Um, fairly restrained. It has a little bit of curvature to the mansard roof, which is which is great. It's a full three stories. So the mansard roof is really kind of trying to hide that that third story. But the the two in the middle here have these like really prominent towers with um, all sorts of wrought iron detail at the top. Um, they're also constructed. Well, the bottom one, I think, is constructed of stone. The one above it is constructed of wood, which would be very uncommon in Denver. Denver is really a city of of masonry construction. Um, so you don't see a lot of the, the wood variants. Um, and I also wanted to point out this sort of top left image, which is the um, Eisenhower Executive Office Building in Washington, DC, which is probably one of the, the biggest and grandest examples of the Second Empire style that you can find in the United States. You know, I mean, it's um, significantly larger, um, but this is uh, built of much, uh, you know, of, of entirely of stone with very classical detailing. I don't know if you can kind of make out the classical cornices excuse me, the classical pediments at the various kind of pavilions of this building. And, and this building actually might remind you or, or be a good nod to the origins of this style, which is really of um, French Renaissance architecture. You know, if you kind of are able to picture the streets of Paris, you'll, you can easily imagine them lined with buildings like this Eisenhower executive office building with, you know, four or five story buildings with a, with a large mansard roof on top. So that's, that's really the origin of this style. And it's very interesting to see, you know, that origin in the Eisenhower executive building, and then compare that with, uh, you know, the quaint residential buildings you see around Denver in this style. Moving on, we're going to look at the Romanesque revival here, a residential example. So um, one of the main features of this is, again, a rusticated stone exterior, which you can see here with this really rough faced masonry, um, a moderately or shallow pitched roof here. It's a pretty, it's kind of a one over one roof. So right about in the middle at 45 degrees. Uh, sometimes there'll be hints of classical detailing, which you might see in the uh, capitals or in like the dentals around the tower here, but those are contrasted with, you know, the crenellations above that, which are much more castle-like. Um, you'll also see a lot of windows on these buildings divided by um, what I refer to as like a heavy stone tracery. Um, so on the tower here, the way you have these double hung windows with the arched window above separated by this, this kind of heavy stone lintel. Next, we can look at uh, a commercial example of the Romanesque revival. Um, so it's, uh, you can see some of the similarities here. Obviously the form is much different. It's much more boxy because it's a commercial building, but you have the same, you know, prominent cornice, these, this heavy, heavy uh, masonry with these, you know, thick arches. Um, and then you also see things like the decorative patterns of masonry in the, the spandrel panels between the second and third story. Um, you know, this one is interesting because before we were looking at really heavy rusticated all stone. And then here it's stone and brick and it's not quite as rusticated, but, but the contrast between these, um, you know, speaks to, to this heavy masonry that is being used. And again, that weight is maybe exemplified more in these, these really wide piers and these thick arches over smaller arches and things like that. Um, and even there's um, between the larger arch and the smaller arch, you can see these sort of little slits, which are kind of a funny, nod to that same castle architecture. They look like um, arrow slits that you'd see on a castle, but they're on a commercial building on Broadway. So kind of an interesting, uh, again, thinking about that romanticism, those, those uh, the, the era that that architecture is coming from. And then of course, um, Romanesque revival is one that is, was quite common for institutional buildings. So here we have St. Elizabeth's Church um, in Auraria. Uh, again, you can see these same features of this rusticated heavy stone interior, ex exterior, 
Um, but you have some more of the church elements like the buttressing, um, you know, the rose window, the lancet windows, things like that. And I'll also draw your attention to the entrance of this church, um, sort of at the bottom center, which is a good example of the of a Romanesque feature of this sort of curved, you know, the fully rounded arch as opposed to the pointed arch of the Gothic style. And then that the columns are sort of vaguely classical, but they have what's called a cushion capital, which is um, really distinctive to the Romanesque revival. So this is a great transition into one of those themes that we're introducing in this series, which I sort of touched on when I was talking about the Second Empire, but is talking about uh, historical precedence and adaptation. So, you know, many buildings and many styles draw inspiration from existing buildings, sometimes, you know, something in the city, but sometimes something half the world away in Europe or maybe in Asia or anywhere else. Um, and, and really this idea of dividing architecture into styles is much more of a modern construct. Uh, historically, people sort of just had these modes of buildings and decorating that evolved over time very slowly, but those were then in a more modern view distilled into these styles. And so through that process, um, architects, historians, academics, um, would study these different styles and kind of try to distill them down, uh, well, would study these modes of building and then try to distill them down into styles so that they could be used by academics or designers. So, excuse me, one kind of example of this is a, is a small book I have actually from 1869. It's a glossary of terms used in Grecian, Roman, Italian, and Gothic architecture. Um, and it's a really, you know, it's filled with pages like I've shown here on the right where they're showing you know, here are the three orders of the classical or, you know, the Grecian or the Roman architecture. And then below that are, you know, variations on a porch on maybe a Romanesque building versus a Gothic building. And providing all of these images is really providing, um, again, a, a set of resources that architects um, and other designers can use as they're, you know, trying to work in a style um, to design. So I um, wanted to point out a specific example of thinking about that recycling of styles, um, which we often call revivalism, and that there is more to it than just replicating you know, those features. So you wouldn't necessarily go to your dictionary and find the image of the porch and then just copy it, but it may be you know, adapting or modifying those details or combining details from different buildings. Um, and then there's also a really interesting element of this of taking details that may have been on a church and applying to them to a more modern building like a school. So this is a, an interesting example where the center image there is the Cathedral of Saint Trophim in um, Arles, France, which is a true Romanesque building. Um, and, you know, compare that to probably Denver's greatest example of Romanesque architecture, which is South High School. Um, though, interestingly, that building's a little bit later than, it's a little bit late within the history of uh, Romanesque revival architecture. But um, you can see some of these similarities, you know, this very grand entrance, the columns around it, the, you know, compounding, um, you know, windows divided by uh, vertical features, um, such as columns. So like if you compare that window in the tower of South High School to the window over the middle of the Romanesque building, um, you know, you can see how there's a connection between these two, but they're also different. Um, and that also touches on that this is a larger historical trend that um, getting back to that idea that styles are really a modern construct. Historically styles were again, just these modes of building that over sometimes centuries would evolve into different forms. So on the left is, uh, the far left is the, the Maison Carré, which is in Nimes, France, which is, you know, very quintessential Roman temple. Uh, and then if you look at that again to the Saint Trophime church in Arles, you know, you can see kind of that the connection between these, that this Romanesque style, really the term comes from the fact that it's a, you know, a distillation and a, uh, an adaptation of Roman forms. You know, the capitals are similar to those on the temple, but are shrunk down and pushed out and distorted. The, the arch is introduced and sort of overblown and breaks into the classical pediment on the Romanesque church. And then Romanesque eventually also becomes Gothic revival. The far right there is, of course, uh, Notre Dame in Paris. Um, and, you know, when we go from the Maison Carré, which is from the first century, to the um, Notre Dame, which is from the 13th century, though heavily adapted in the, or uh, rehabilitated in the 18th century, uh, you can see that this progression from these styles, uh, you know, stretches across centuries, if not millennia. Um, 
So as we're thinking about that, I wanted to, this is again a page showing some other examples of the Romanesque revival in Denver. Um, on the bottom there is the, the cable building, uh, the cable railway company building um, in the downtown. Above it is the Boston building, which is uh, a you know, fabulous example of a, a large commercial Romanesque building in um, Denver, and then another smaller residence. And then compare that with these other buildings, which are um, Austin Hall at Harvard Law School on the top, uh, Saint, uh, excuse me, Trinity Church in Boston on the bottom center, and then the um, Smithsonian Castle on the bottom left uh, in Washington, D.C. And you can see that um, I kind of intentionally picked some much more exuberant uh, examples of the Romanesque revival style than I think you typically find in Denver. Um, you know, in particular on Austin Hall and Trinity Church, which are both the works of H.H. H. Richardson, um, who is probably the most famous architect to work in this style. There's a lot of kind of interplay of color here of contrasting stone colors and patterns in the masonry that, uh, you know, make these uh, very heavy stone buildings very vibrant and interesting. Um, and again, these pulling a lot of uh, inspiration from, uh, from actual Romanesque buildings in Europe. Um, and so it's interesting to compare those with uh, some of these other buildings in Denver. You know, the tramway building also interestingly is uh, entirely a brick facade versus the others that are stone. So that's kind of an interesting um, aspect of the architecture here. This next theme we wanted to introduce is talking about architect design versus vernacular. And really here we're gonna actually focus on vernacular and what vernacular architecture means. Most of the examples we've looked at so far are um, more architect design, more intentionally set to a style. So vernacular is often what, what, what we call high style. So vernacular is often kind of encapsulated in this idea of architecture without architects. So these will be your everyday buildings. They're often designed or adapted to meet local needs. And they're often um, built in traditional methods using available materials. Maybe the most quintessential example of a vernacular building in the US would be the log cabin there um, on the left, uh, but there's also other things like the adobe architecture shown on the right, which are which are pretty common, um, pretty uh, typical examples of vernacular architecture. But interestingly, the vernacular in Denver doesn't really look like that. Those are, you know, maybe some of the types of things you would have seen on the very early frontier, you know, where you're just building from whatever materials you have on hand. But the vernacular architecture in Denver um, in the era we're looking at is a little bit different. Um, most architecture is probably a lot of what was built was vernacular. There weren't necessarily architects running around and designing the buildings, but it isn't always that sort of rough and tumble design of like a log cabin or an adobe building. They can be adaptations of high style buildings. So it could be a type, you know, something as simple as just a cottage type, which would be a small scale building that's decorated in a, in a style where they're they're maybe seeing an architect design building and, and pulling some of the details. Um, or, as is also very common, these details are being pulled from uh, design manuals or pattern books. So um, the left hand image is, is pulled from a pretty famous um, pattern book from the mid 19th century, which is showing, you know, a, a basic floor plan and how you could decorate a sort of um, carpenter Gothic house. Um, but these books would also sometimes have details. So that middle page is showing more specific details for a different building and how you might, you know, carve the brackets on your Italianate house or how you decorate the windows. And, and so someone, uh, you know, a, a master builder or a craftsperson could have one of these books and be just pulling details uh, and making them themselves, but then applying them, you know, however they feel is appropriate on the building. And I also wanted to touch on, you know, what readily found materials means. It could be something that's locally sourced. It could be you know, stones that are, you're pulling from a river or the lumber that you're cutting down. Um, but it could also mean materials that are mass produced and that are massively, uh, excuse me, readily available because of the quantity of their production and then that they're being shipped in on the railroads and things like that. So on the right hand is actually a catalog from a cast iron manufacturer where you could, you know, pick the, the railings or the crest work that you want to apply to your, um, you know, to your building. So someone could be building and designing a house entirely from you know, a pattern book, pulling specific details and then ordering things that are mass produced to all be you know, applied to this building. So the most common kind of vernacular 
building that you'll see in Denver from this era is what we often call the folk Victorian, which is a very simple massing. It's often just a gabled structure, um, very modest in scale, both you know one, one and a half stories. Um, they'll often have a somewhat regular roof pattern, moderately steep roof, and a full width or maybe just a partial width porch. So. Um, the left-hand image is of the Fager residence, which is an individual landmark here in Denver, um, which is a rare um, wood frame building that you can find here in Denver. The more common, I would say, folk Victorian building you're gonna find in Denver is the one on the right, which is what we often refer to as like a Queen Anne cottage. Um, it has a lot of similarities to that uh, other building. It's a little bit more detailed though. You know, it has the nested gable. Um, it has just a partial width porch, but it has a lot more detail but this, you know, this building is actually sandwiched between two other buildings that are basically identical. And, you know, there are some areas where there's just blocks of these buildings, probably not designed by architects, but instead, um, you know, built by a, a team of builders who um, kind of piece together the design of this building based off of some of those things we're talking about and then apply them to this very simple form. Uh, I mentioned that we often call those a Queen Anne cottage. That's because, again, those details are taken from the more grand, probably architect designed Queen Anne buildings. Um, and one of the big distinctions of where you move from that simple form is to, you know, this type of grander Queen Anne house will have a more complicated massing. So uh, here you can see the double height front porch. There's a cross gable with a sort of projecting bay on the left hand side there um, that make this building a little more. Um, again, complex and also gets to that, um, looking back to that kind of picturesque idea of like something that's not as formal, it's not symmetrical and perfectly balanced, but kind of dynamic and interesting. Um, and one of the main traits of the Queen Anne style is just a lot of detail. There's, you know, in the gable here, you have a lot of texture and the way the shingles are applied. There's a lot of variation in the window arrangements. You have all of the detail at the porch with the turned columns and the spindle work and you have you know carved masonry around that um, first floor front window with a you know really ornamented stained glass window above it um, so these are really much more like colorful and vibrant buildings um, and and this is probably the most common style i would say from this era that you'll find in denver um, and um, mostly it's used in a, as a residential type, but um, you'll also, of course, see this as uh, kind of a multifamily, still residential, but larger scale buildings. So this is sort of a row house type building on uh, East 17th Avenue. And you can see some of those same traits where there's a little bit of color introduced through, uh, you know, the brick in contrast to the natural stone, as well as then the painted wood details. Um, in the window frames, you have a prominent porch with a lot of decoration. Uh, you have this kind of really interesting paneling detail on the gable of the uh, the dormers at the third floor. So um, this is a, a really fabulous example of a, of a multifamily Queen Anne building. Um, I'll also say, you know, there's a lot of variety you'll see in the details of Queen Anne structures. Um, I sort of noted here on the left that you'll have turned spindle work, which is, I think, what we've been seeing on these two examples. It's called turned because it's a piece of wood that's put into a lathe, which rotates the wood and allows you to kind of make these complex but round shapes. Um, but you'll also sometimes find different types of details, like what are called East Lake details that are very kind of geometric, um, maybe floral patterns. Um, or classically inspired details in some cases. So uh, again, here's some examples of um, uh, different Queen Anne buildings in Denver. Um, this one kind of bottom center is interesting because it actually has a good amount of Romanesque influence with this really prominent arched window and these sort of stout capitals, uh, excuse me, columns and capitals at the porch. But it has this classical pediment with all this decoration in it. And then to the left of that is one that has a lot more classical influence in, you know, I don't know if you can kind of see these uh, kind of Doric or Tuscan columns on the porch, um, which is quite different than some of the other ones where you're seeing a lot more of the turned detail. Um, but the Queen Anne is, is probably one of the more diverse uh, styles that you'll see, just the breadth if you look at this of, of what you're looking at in the form and in the, again, the massing and detailing of it, you know, that top left image is a pretty modest I would say um, Queen Anne House, it looks like it has kind of classical columns, but it still has some of those features in terms of the complex massing and the, the texturing of the wall surface with the shingles and things like that. So it's, uh, and then to the right of that is a really, you know, over the top um, 
example of a Queen Anne building with this turret and all of this complex detail um, applied onto it. So uh, that brings us to the end of uh, architectural styles in Denver part one. Um, I hope I didn't go through that too quickly. Um, we are gonna again have two more parts um, on the 19th and the 26th of this month. Uh, and I hope we'll see you there. But um, in the meantime, happy to take uh, any questions if anyone has any. Well, not seeing any questions. Thank you for the compliments, everyone. Very kind. Um, but we'll, we'll just stick around. If you you know want to sign off, feel free. Um, or again, stay on if you have any questions. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Question from Karen uh, to go over styles versus types in more detail. Sure, let me go back to that um, slide. Um, where is it? Here we go. So um, again, it's, it's really type you can think about. I most often think about it in terms of um, the, the floor plan or the arrangement and kind of massing of the building. So thinking about the four square, it's uh, a pretty square floor plan that's, you know, very consistently just divided into these four rooms. Um, you know, you can almost, if you see a four square, you could walk, you know, close your eyes and walk yourself through it because the the that that plan is repeated so much. If you walk in, it's an entrance hall to the right is kind of a living room or parlor, a dining room beyond that, and then a kind of kitchen area behind it. And then you go upstairs and it's you know three or four bedrooms with you know a little bit of variety there, but. Um, uh, you know, the, the type is a way of, you know, thinking about these, these forms that are repeated. So another example is uh, like a bungalow, um, which is uh, something we'll talk about in the next series when we're, or excuse me, in the next part when we're talking about uh, craftsman architecture, where there's again, an, often a repeated floor plan, but it's also a repeated form of a much more shallow roof um, and uh sort of a prominent gable with a, a porch on the front. Um, you know, contrast that again with the architectural style, which is more of an emphasis on these details and, um, you know, the where the inspiration is being drawn for the decoration of the building. So again, looking at this image, same floor plan, but very different treatments of the exterior, different, slightly different porch roof forms, but different types of brackets and texturing, you know, the use of multicolored masonry versus all one color masonry. Um, and, and things like that. I hope that adds a little more clarity. Abby, do you have anything to add? I feel like I'm blathering. I think in brief, just that type is, yeah, really just about the form and style really gets into the detailing. So Foursquare is a great one because you can have a lot of different stylistic elements applied. Bungalow is another good one. A basic bungalow is just that small one and a half one, one and a half story with a big front porch. It's what detail you apply to it that like may make it a craftsman bungalow, but it's just really a bungalow on its own can, you know, it's just really about that type and arrangement. Like things like a shotgun, it's another, you know, kind of iconic type. And it's all about the, you know, narrow width and you know, the rectangular design. Um, uh, so question then, so for identifying, should we identify type first and then style? Uh, that can certainly be helpful. I mean, not, you know, it depends. Some buildings like a Queen Anne is so rambling that it really just has that style. It doesn't have a clear type, but certainly with something like, um, you know, just that vernacular, the like full Victorian that we just looked at, these are a gable front. So you, for a type, you could say that they're a gable front. And then you can also say that they're full Victorian due to the type of detailing that they have. Uh, so it really kind of depends. Some buildings don't have a clear type or form, but most do. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, barring no other questions, thank you all again for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much.